The next thing I'd like to talk to you about is the things that just don't add up about our education that's going on with children and the challenges that they have. There's anomalies, there's contradictions, there's things that completely just would defy belief. We, I just cannot understand how they happen. And so I would like to say to you, welcome to my world of being curious. These are the things that got me curious as to what was actually happening here. Um, there's things about literacy that don't add up. We've got bright, exceptional, creative people, yet they can't do literacy. And that is just astounding for many, many people. And many, many parents, they, the amount of parents that say to me, my kid's really bright and they can explain to me why. Why can't they do literacy? They're often very eloquent verbally, um, but not in written work. Their reading is often better than their spelling. Now that's another confusion. How can your reading be better than your spelling? And all of these topics we're going to address. Why do some people prefer capital letters? Why do some people prefer reading cartoons? Has anybody ever noticed that a cartoon book, normally the words that are written in the speech bubbles are in capitals? They're not in upper and lower case. Why can kids often spell long words better than they can spell short ones? Why are children better at spelling in one language than they are in another? That's a, that is something that's completely overlooked. Lots of people know that it's easier to spell in Spanish than it is in English, but they don't go, so how is that happening? And that's what we've been investigating. And how do you learn words like homophones phonetically when they sound just the same and they've got a completely different spelling. And I'll give you my favourite example, which is eight and eight. I ate my T, A-T-E, and the number eight, E-I-G-H-T. They've hardly got a letter in common, let alone having them in the right order. Now there's some things about maths that just don't add up. Doing mental arithmetic without visualising images or numbers is impossible. I know from personal experience, I have a maths degree, and I could always do mental arithmetic, very fast in class. Um, but you're not taught this skill and you're not taught the fact that you need to visualise numbers. Adding up might be all right, but when it comes to algebra like 3x plus 4y, some people just find that really confusing. Rotating images is normally one of the things that people who struggle can do really easily because what, you, you're moving a triangle round, the four quadrants, and they find that sort of thing really simple. And some people don't learn how to use their visual memory for words and numbers, whilst others do it naturally. So it's a lottery when you're at school as to whether you're going to pick this skill up or not, because you're not going to be taught it, unless you're in an enlightened school. There's some things about concentration that don't add up. And how many children do you know who really struggle with concentration? If you send them out to play in a green field for 20 minutes, they can concentrate. We have the research about this. How can children struggle to concentrate in class when they can concentrate on their computer for hours? So they clearly can concentrate. It's the environment they're concentrating in. Why do things like weighted blankets and fish oils, etc., help with concentration and focus? Because there's a lot of research being done about those, but nobody seems to know why they work. Why don't some people know which way the letters go around and they may even see letters moving on the page? How do they do that? And I was absolutely fascinated when I looked at that one is how do people get the letters moving around on the page? How do parents skills relate to those of a child? Because a lot of people will start talking about genetics. I want to know why a child has got some of the same confusing skills their parents have got but they haven't actually got the exact same version. And the solution is about understanding your experience, people understanding their own experience, and learning from what the experts do. So when you, it's like best practice. When you've got somebody who can do something really well, and you've got somebody who can't do it, you can learn from somebody who does it well. Some things about teacher education don't add up. In the UK, every school is instructed to teach the children. Multisensory teaching and learning is specified in the national curriculum. Now, that's not going to be the same thing worldwide, but it's true in a number of countries. But teachers aren't trained in how a child learns visually and what can go wrong. So they teach them visually, 
which is like showing them a map of Africa. That's teaching visually. What they're not doing is checking what the child is doing with that in their brain, how they're learning visually. Visual learning is not currently mentioned in the early years framework. Fluent literacy is an auditory and a visual process in three steps. Firstly, you need to know what the letters look like and what they sound like. Then you need to know how letters are grouped together into phonemes and what they sound like. And then you need to know what words look and sound like. And once you've seen a word a couple of times, what you need to be doing is storing that word as a word. And we have, re we have um, research on that from um, Georgetown in Washington, where they've done MRI scans and they can prove exactly that. When children don't start with nouns, then they've got nothing to get them to access the occipital temporal region of their brain. Now, the occipital temporal region of your brain is just underneath the crown of your head. So when, you, when you're visualising something, so if I ask you to, visual, uh, to imagine an elephant, your brain goes to that bit of your brain, sees the elephant and comes up with a picture. Okay? Same thing you can say, imagine your house, imagine your car, whatever. You always go to the occipital temporal region of your brain. And that's where we see on MRI scans people are reading from, the occipital temporal region of their brain, because they're recognising words when they're fluent readers. And if you don't start off with nouns, like cat, dog, object words, so you've got cat, dog, chair, table, etc., you're not triggering that part of your brain, which is what you want to do. And we need to learn from those who are skilled. Any good speller will tell you that they can see words in their mind's eye really easily. They're normally around here somewhere. And so if you ask them to spell a complicated word, they will just look up, see it and spell it. And the very interesting fact is that the, about half the population do this so automatically they don't realise they're doing it and the other half of the population don't know what you're talking about. So it's really an interesting, it's a very interesting life I lead. If you look at what's going on in the literacy and numeracy environment and those people who are trying to uh, work in this area, almost all of the research is focused on the deficit of a child, the things that they don't seem to be able to do. They don't focus on what they're really good at, which is what a coaching paradigm does. So when you work in the coaching way with somebody, you look at what they're really good at and work out how that can actually best, those skills can best be used for the things that they're not so good at. At Empowering Learning, we don't support people in their confusion. We teach people the essential how-to skills to give them new skills so that they don't need to be confused. And by the time they've learned some new skills, they can often become symptom-free whilst they maintain their exceptional skills.